is on Gestalt Psychology. I'm Kelsey. I'm Allie. And I'm Liz. So what is Gestalt Psychology? It is the organizing phenomena of whole meaningful pictures. It was founded in 1912 by Max Werthemer, and pretty much it's just talking about looking at the bigger picture rather than the parts of the picture, and the, field, the central field is perception. They have some Organizing principles that are very important, which we'll get into later on in the presentation, but their figure ground, proximity, similarity, continuity, pregnancy, closure. So these are just some of the many people that were involved in developing Gestalt psychology and all the different aspects to it. And so these just showed that there's plenty of fields, there are lots of people. These are some of the bigger ones, such as Edmund Herschel, Kurt Lewin. Um, Max Werthemer, uh, Kurt Kafka, and Kohler, and there's plenty others, and it really just shows the large array and range of disciplines that came into play in order to create this field. There's different fields that range from phenomenology all the way to physics. So, um, the psychology field didn't play much of a role until later on in the development. So the first person that we're going to talk about tonight is Max Werthemer. He is the founder of Gestalt Psychology, and he founded the field in 1912. Uh, Werthemer is Czech, and he comes from a family of well-off people. His great-grandfather was a baron, and because of this, his family inherited a lot of money and was able to pursue whatever kind of studies he wanted. Um, growing up, he was very good at playing uh, both violin and piano. And in 1910, he published work on Vedic music. And in this paper, which came immediately before the five phenomenon work he did, there's a lot of ideas of Gestalt psychology. So although people do credit five phenomenon as the beginning, you can see in his work preceding it that he already had these ideas in the works, and without his connection to music, he might not have come to this. Um, Werthemer's work with uh, Gestalt psychology began with apparent motion, which was very popular at the time uh, because of motion pictures. Uh, a lot of people were studying it. Um, Basically, what it is, is the blinking of lights that creates the idea of motion. This paper was published in 1912, and that was said to be the beginning of the field. Um, the participants in this study were himself, uh, Kafka, Kohler, and Kafka's wife. and. When this was published, all of these became founders of the field. Um, Werthmer didn't like the name of apparent motion, so he changed it to five phenomenon. And his paper concluded that we perceive whole meaningful parts where a whole is different from the sum of all of its parts. Um, following his work on five phenomenon, he taught at the University of Frankfurt in Germany where he became good friends with many notable names, such as Albert Einstein. It's been said that the theory of relativity has very useful ideas in it, and that their, their friendship kind of helped him come to that in his studies. In 1933, uh, Werthmer left Germany to go to the United States due to Hitler's policy on Jewish professionals. Uh, he was no longer allowed to be a professor at the university, so he decided to leave and he went to New York where he had worked with many Jewish scientists, including Einstein. So for five phenomenon, it's kind of hard to explain, but at its basis, it's the idea of lights linking um, in such close proximity to each other that 
it creates the idea of movement. So in this very holiday uh, depiction, you can see Santa waving, um, but really it's just the lights blinking on and off at a speed of So coming from apparent motion, we have the waterfall effect. It kind of uses this idea of apparent motion with the movement of uh, light along with some other Gestalt principles that we'll go over later, such as figure ground. Um, this concept goes back as far as Aristotle, but basically the idea is that you focus on a point on a screen for a specific amount of time and then after that time passes and the movement is completed it transfers over to an image usually a waterfall that is shown afterwards so here's an example of that Right now, what you want to do, if you could see this, is to stare at the dot for 30 seconds and then the motion will appear. You're going to continue to watch that and then when it is completed, it will give you the idea that the waterfall is moving. Um, we'll attach the link to the video in our email to you so that you can So now I'm going to turn it over to Kelsey, who is going to talk about Kafka. Okay, so Kurt Kafka was also just as important as Max Werthmer. He was born in Berlin, Germany in 1886, and he actually introduced Gestalt to America, which was really important because Gestalt was very German-based. He, before getting involved with Gestalt, though, he, in the beginning of World War I, he was involved in some military research where he determined that he wanted to be involved in the research on sound. So from there, he ended up um, studying people that had hearing impairments from brain damages because of what he saw during the military. And um, he, it was Gestalt's major theorist, which was very important. And he extended Gestalt ideas into developmental psychology. He wrote Principles of Gestalt Psychology in 1935, but it was very dead, so honestly not many people wanted to read it. But he also wrote um, The Growth of Mind, which was considered responsible for awakening the Gestalt ideas and concepts. He was also a student under Carl Stumpf, which we learned throughout all of history and systems this year. But just a fun fact was that he married Myra Klein, who was one of his uh, research experimenters on his dissertation research, but then he ended up divorcing Klein and marrying a woman named Elizabeth Algram, who in the same year he got divorced to Algram and remarried Klein, but then five years later, in 1928, he divorced, Algram. He divorced Klein and married Algram again, so pretty much he was going back and forth between the two women. But also, he didn't start off in psychology, he started off in philosophy, and then around 1906 is when he started his career in psychology. So he didn't start off in So next I'm going to talk about Wolfgang Kohler. Um, like the other two founders of Gestalt Psychology, he didn't start with a psychology background. His background is actually physics. Um, he was one of the participants in the study on five phenomenon, and throughout that period, it was said that uh, him, Carl
Kafka and Mortimer became really good friends. They spent a lot of time together talking about all kinds of things, um, not just the apparent motion that they were working with. And because of this, um, it's thought that the work was even better because they, you know, had bonded and were really working together well as um, counterparts in the field. Uh, Werthemer is known as Gestalt's most influential um, spokesperson, and this is mostly because he lived 23 years longer than both um, Werthemer and Kolb and Kafka. He also was a proponent for making sure that people were hearing about what was happening in the field and spreading um, the word about what was being said. Especially, he wrote another book um, called Gestalt Psychology. It was much easier and simpler to read than um, Kafka's book and became much more popular. Um, he is most well known for his work in the Canary Islands. He went there to work uh, right before World War II and was stranded on Tenerife with his family for seven years due to the war. Um, there he worked with primates and these came from Africa. They were shipped over. So Tenerife is off of the west coast of Africa and that's where they got these animals from. They weren't native to where he was. Um, he stayed there for a long time and did other work, not just with the apes on Insight, which Liz will tell you more about, but he also worked with other primates like orangutans on other research while he was there because aside from the beautiful beaches, there's not really much to do. Um, after his research was done, he published a book called Mentality of the Apes. And this concluded that animals do use insight. Uh, it wasn't until 1920 that he was able to return to Germany. And there he went back and was teaching. Uh, interesting fact about Kohler is that he was um, very against the Nazi regime, especially the rule about um, working professionals and the fact that Jewish professors were no longer allowed to teach. Uh, he was really outraged by it, and he actually spoke out and wrote anti-Nazi anti work. Um, people were uh, very shocked that he wasn't arrested for what he was saying, and because of all the tension, he did eventually go to the U.S. in 1935. And so as Ali just said, we're going to move into talking about Kohler and the Apes, which was one of the first studies that prove or that support the assault theories and um, the organizing principles. So the most famous ape in the study was Sultan. And so he, the object was to receive your food in the area that they were provided and they were allowed to stack boxes, they were allowed to use sticks, um, and they needed to reach up to get the food and the food was uh, taller than the researcher actually was. And we have a video to show this and you'll see that the researcher looks to be close to six feet tall and he has to reach above his head in order to get the bananas onto the hook that they're suspended from. And so the conclusion of this study was that the monkeys had to perceive all parts of the problem in order to come to a conclusion and in order to solve the problem, whereas before it was believed that it was just a trial and error. But from here they used some trial and error, but once they finally recognize all that needed to go into this problem to fix it and perceive all the parts to it, they are able to get the solution to it. And so we have a video to show a little bit of it. While Liz gets that ready, uh, just to clarify, we have since cleared up what kind of primate was used and Kohler was working with chimpanzees while he was in Thank you. 
and he ended up getting wounded. But while he was recovering, he wrote The War with the Landscape, which later helped with concepts that he developed in different parts of psychology. And he ended up getting the German uh, Iron Cross, which was a decoration medal. He was asked by Ogden to come over in, from Germany to the United States because he didn't think that it was safe for psychologists like Ali was talking about um, to stay there with the Nazi regime and um, Hitler. So he moved here and he went to Cornell first for two years and then he started to develop his ideas and his psychology and all that stuff. But what he was really big into was um, making research centers for different fields of psychology. And in 1944, he moved to Boston and he got what he was working for for like years, um, group dynamics at MIT. And that's where he later ended up dying of a heart attack and he didn't get to finish all of his research that he wanted to do. So now we're gonna move into Gestalt therapy, which we didn't really have an opportunity to go much in depth with in our preliminary presentation. And so Gestalt therapy, it had a large German influence and it still does to this day. We tried as hard as we could to get a lot of information on this. Unfortunately, a lot of it we had to translate and even still it didn't translate right. So we tried our hardest to kind of piece together the best we can about it. And so we found that these are several very influential people in the Gestalt therapy world. The biggest one being Fritz Perls who is the found, considered the founder of Gestalt Therapy. And so he actually studied as, he studied medicine before World War I and then served as a medic in World War I. And from there, he then started to look into psychoanalytical training and he actually opened an institute up in South Africa to teach others how to work in the psychoanalytical field and help those that actually have been in war. Then he actually had met Freud and just like you, Dr. Quinn, not a fan of Freud. And so he, although I got to meet him and that is a noteworthy thing on his part, he wasn't a fan of him at all. He, find, he after all was said and done, and he actually bounced around from countries to back to America, all over, and all over Europe, he ended up finally settling in Manhattan, New York, where he opened up with his wife, um, the very first Gestalt, th Gestalt Therapy Training Institute, and they actually ran this out of their apartment in Manhattan. And so because of this, New York is considered the first Gestalt Institute in America. And after he set this, his training up in New York, he then ended up traveling all over the world and did workshops to spread the Gestalt therapy techniques so that others could use this technique and help other people that need it. He ended up dying in 1970 from heart failure after having a heart surgery. And so from there, Gestalt therapy has never really took off in the States, but it actually is big overseas. And we'll go a little bit more into depth on that when we talk about how to get certified in the therapy. So Gestalt therapy techniques, which we had talked about a little bit in our preliminary um, presentation, it's not a set of guidelines, but it's a way of life for some people. So they look at it as experience-based and humanistic therapy because it's more focused on the experience that you're going through rather than like personally. And they call it unfinished business because you're trying to figure out what's conflicting you because it mostly has to affect what's around you as well. And they want you to free oneself because they want you to have a connection with your bodily emotions your bodily sensations and your emotions because then from there you'll be able to figure out what's going on with you. Um, Self-awareness is key so that uh, you can find a way to help what's going on and actually Frederick Pearls said we are working for something else. We are here to promote the growth process and develop the human potential. We do not talk of instant job, instant sensory awareness or instant cure. The growth process is a process that takes time so he's not expecting you to be cured overnight or get like get better overnight. You like he wants it to take time and for you to use the different techniques that we're gonna go and explain. But it's a way for you to truly def like define what you're experiencing and what, what's affecting you. Um, what it looks at is to see like get the individual to be more aware of how they think, act, and feel. And just 
some of the therapy techniques that are out there, which there's like over 50, but there's dialogue, so it's you're developing a dialogue between yourself, two parts of yourself that are conflicting, and you talk back and forth to figure it out. And then staying in the now, so you're having <coughs> the client focus on what is happening to them at that very moment, why they're feeling the way that they're feeling. And then they have role plays to see how the individual is presenting and organizing themselves to see if they can figure out what is actually happening. <coughs> and then open chair, which we're going to demonstrate, is um, you have a client sit in a chair or oh, next to a open chair and they talk to either themselves or someone else that is either hurting their feelings or conflicting them and they try to resolve the problem through talking to this open chair and then they'll switch and they'll be that other person and play that role as well. So I'm going to demonstrate um, an open chair conversation between a student and a professor. It is completely imaginary. Professor, I really didn't like that during our initial presentation, you gave us so much trouble about having a slip up on the word ape. And even though the word monkey wasn't completed, you seem to really be upset with us that we weren't professional. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. I was just coming from a place of your presentation was so good and I was really searching for something wrong with it. And I didn't want you guys to not be sure about it and I wanted to make sure that in your final presentation you would know exactly what you were talking about. That is so smart. I'm glad that we had this conversation to figure out what each of us was thinking. And so, see. So that's an example of someone having a conflict with another person that they're trying to resolve or appropriately approach later on in their life. And I'm going to demonstrate how you would use it to <laughs> solve it within yourself and it's just you talking to yourself looking at both sides of it. So I really need to work on my history and systems presentation but I just my Netflix just is so much more be like just better I can watch Friends, I can watch Gilmore Girls, there's so many better things I can do and I can get sleep and I can just rest even though the project has to get done. Well, you can always watch the Netflix after the fact. Once your project's done, it has a due date, get done in time, then you can watch your Gilmore Girls or Friends or whatever you would like to watch. This is what you gotta do. You have to get certain things done first and then be good. And so there you can see that people will talk to themselves and rationale through why they need to do one thing or another and they can just get both sides of the perspective there. The purpose of this as well is that the therapist is not aiding them or helping them. They're having them work through their problems by talking to this open chair. Even though it might seem awkward, they have found that it is most influential. So there is um, quite a few uses for Gestalt therapy. And uh, mainly it's just to connect both your emotional and physical needs. Um, it helps people feel more self-confident, calm, and at peace. And this is because it's really promoting um, a lot of positive psychology ideas, very humanistic approach looking at the self, where you're trying to look at your own problems and fix them for yourself right now, however you can. Um, a lot of people get an awareness of their internal self, and this is to understanding why they're reacting and behaving in certain ways. So like in the open chair demonstration, you can see that it causes it makes somebody look at both sides of something, um, even if one side is a little more difficult to talk about or to just kind of reason something out in your head that might be an internal conflict. Um, this is been called effective in treating and managing uh, tension, anxiety, depression, and addiction, and a lot of other 
um, issues that are um, in your everyday life where you're not really functioning to your highest potential. And so as we mentioned before, we're going to go into a little bit of how to get certified. And so this actually is not very big in America. And so there actually is no specific track to take in America. This is much bigger overseas. It has a large German influence, like we noted before. And this is actually seen as a very recognizable therapy technique in order to overcome different issues. One of the places where it seems that this is actually the world leader is Australia. When you look into what Australia will do, they have countless programs and opportunities for you to get a diploma, actually, in the self-therapy, whether it's at the undergrad or the graduate level. And so at the undergrad level, it usually takes about three years to do this. And at the graduate level, it takes about two years to complete your degree. And each institute has their own different qualifications and requirements in order to finish up your degree and get the amount of hours practiced in order to receive your diploma. So it varies a little bit depending on what school you go to or what certification process you try to go through. And so the PACFA is what is used in Australia, and it stands for the Psychotherapy and Counseling Federation of Australia. And so they will give you your certificate in Gestalt therapy, and then you can start practicing. Um, and then in America, there, like I said before, there really is no clear way on how to go about getting a certification. And it seems that there are several institutes across the country where you can get certified in gestalt therapy, but none of them have the same track and that you just have to con conclude all the institute's requirements, but there is no actual examination, there is no organization to go through, you just have to complete that institute's requirements in order to be considered a gestalt therapist. Like I said, you don't need to pass any specific nationalized uh, examination, you just have to complete your specific institution's requirements in order to get your certification in gestalt therapy. And it actually is difficult to find a gestalt therapist that's qualified. When we were looking, it seemed that there's only about a handful just in the Rhode Island, Connecticut, Massachusetts area, I'd say probably under 20. And it just is not very common over here, so not many people get certified in this. But some of the states that are very big into using gestalt therapy are California, New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, and Louisiana. So in some research that we did, we came across a gestalt therapy prayer that gestalt therapists use as like their creed. So actually, it was um, made up by Frederick Pearls. And it's, I do my thing and you do your thing. I am not in this world to live up to your expectations, and you are not in this world to live up to mine. You are you and I am I, and if by chance you find each other, it's beautiful. If not, it can't be helped. So he wrote this as a statement of independence in a person's social life, but throughout the years, people have argued that he, they think that this is like not right because people should form relationships to help them develop as a person rather than you focus on you and I focus on me. And um, he, this is just this is known to be sparking arguments across self therapy and it's to have the individual look at themselves living in harmony according to their own needs and what they feel so you're not feeling as though you have to live up to Liz's expectations of my presenting and I should just focus on me and what I feel. So it's just interesting that this came across when we were doing research. So now we're about to change gears and completely and move into the Gestalt principles of or, organizing principles of good of perception. So we're just going to look at this real quick. So it's just an overview of some of the Gestalt principles that we're going to go through. I know it's probably hard to see, but this is proximity, similarity, continuity, closure, symmetry, and pregnancy. And we'll get more into detail, but these are very important to Gestalt therapy and how they talk about perception. There's also, as a fun fact, Gestalt actually means form, and this I think is probably the easiest way that you're going to see where it got its name from. And so we move into the first one, which is proximity, and this one just explains how you perceive items that are close together. And so as you can see, you, per you perceive this in a cluster, and you perceive that one into being a square. 
because they are close together in relation to the others, and so you perceive them as being proximal, and you just perceive them as one whole, as opposed to the separate, in that case, nine blocks, and the several blocks that are here, you perceive them as one whole thing. So then we move to similarity. So similarity is we're perceiving the object as similar and group them together. So it actually doesn't matter what color or size the objects are, you'll still look at them as similar. So like we all see this as a big triangle with a medium triangle and a semi-medium triangle and a small triangle. So it's all upside down triangles with big triangles, so they're all similar. And then when we go over here, we see that this forms a triangle within circles, but then these triangles are all the same as well. So it doesn't matter what color or um, yeah, what color or size it is. It's all similar to how we're perceiving it in the picture. So now I'm going to talk about um, continuity, which is basically just perceiving continuous lines. So in the first image, you see two separate lines this first curved line and then the straight line instead of perceiving it as separate half circles. And then in the second one, you perceive this as being two continuous lines, even though it's made up of all um, circles that are separate from each other. And it's also the idea of simplicity where we see this as two lines instead of four lines, which you could perceive as well, but basically the idea is keeping it as simple as possible. The next idea is closure, which is that even though the images are not completed and they're not like outlined by all the lines, you can still tell what they are. So in the first image, we see a dog, the second one, a giraffe, and in the third, 